Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Bristol Distinguished Address, which will be delivered by Joe Garner, Chief Executive of the Nationwide Building Society. My name is Nordin Shahabuddin, and I'm Director of the Bristol Business Engagement here, Centre here at UE Bristol. Joe's topic will be on leadership for mutual benefit. But before we invite Joe onto the stage, let me explain to you a, a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, in, the, in an event of a fire, uh, and we have no fires or fire drills planned for today, uh, please exit this building through these doors and also at the exits at the back, uh, wherever is nearest to you, and our event ushers will guide you safely out of the building. Just in terms of the order for today, uh, we have Tom Woolard, uh, who will say a few words about the business that he has co-founded called Punk, and also his experience of setting up his business within the university's graduate incubator. So that will be the session on our graduate showcase. Later, Terry Lockwood, uh, who is the national counsel, national counselor for the Federation of Small Business, will come up to the stage to introduce our keynote speaker. At the end of the keynote speech, I'll come back to the front of the stage and um, moderate the Q&A session. So please have your questions uh, ready. So can I now invite Tom? So as you all know, the university puts on these, well, arranges these series, um, distinguished address series, so that they can bring in experienced business people to the university so they can share their experiences with students, members of the local business community, and staff here at UWE. This is part of the university's enterprise agenda, and I'm here today to talk to you about another aspect of this agenda, and that's how UWE has helped launch and supports a number of startups through the university. I was fortunate enough to be able to present to my startup bunk here nine months ago during this series. And just to recap quickly, Bunk is fixing the broken rental market. We're creating a new digital solution, a platform that provides all the tools for a tenant and landlords to facilitate their relationship and transactions in one marketplace. For tenants, we allow deposit-free journey and the ability to secure and manage everything through an app. And for landlords, we might allow them to manage their property portfolio without the need to go through an agent. I'm here today to explain how the university has helped Bunk, and I can safely say that without their supports that we've received over the last two years, we would not have made the same progress to date. I graduated from this business school some 20 months ago, and along with two co-founders, were one of the first companies to join LaunchSpace, the university's graduate incubator, which is now part of the larger university enterprise zone. LaunchSpace is helping founders like me develop the skills needed to grow businesses. Businesses that are now employing and employing people, raising finances, and delivering tomorrow's high-tech growth companies. In addition to office space, UWE has helped the business with strategy, planning, pitching, and fundraising. The UWE team managing launch space are effectively additional members in our startups, and they're always there to share their knowledge and support throughout our growth. The university's pro bono and accounting clinic have been used by Bunk and many other startups in the space. When it comes to fundraising, the university have even supported us through competitions such as Pitch at Palace, where we recently secured new angel investors. We have been able to access innovation and development grants, which again have accelerated our growth. We have worked with undergraduates interns who have recently hired as full-time employees. And we are part of an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial community that has helped and inspired us. This community is now 75 companies strong. Companies spanning across robotics, self-driving cars, IoT, assisted learning, and even drones. In 20 months, we have grown from four to 14 staff members. We have been recognized on the Disruptive Southwest Index, 
and we are now closing our, fun, our seed round with some fantastic investors. We are actively rolling out our rental platform, growing our company, and who knows, maybe one day we'll be invited back to give the main talk at one of these series. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Terry Lockwood. I'm the uh, representative for this region on the Federation of Small Businesses National Council. Um, I just want to say, though, before I start, I, just, I was just speaking to this young man, and the, one of the reasons he's smiling so broadly is he's just on the point of securing £1.2 million of funding from his funding uh, round, and I think he deserves a round of applause for that. And the way he's going, there's a very good chance he will be invited back to speak <laughs> as a main speaker in the future. Um, if any of you don't know about the Federation of Small Businesses, we are uh, the largest business organisation in this country with 170,000 members, each of whom, like me, uh, runs a small business. Some of us run several businesses, but at least one. Um, I'm a volunteer. Uh, I run my business and I do my Federation of Small Businesses activity uh, for fun in my spare time. Uh, but it does, it does get very demanding. Some of you will have seen the Federation being very active in lobbying government for improvements in the situation uh, of support of small businesses and the legislation that governs, governs that. Um, so that's Federation of Small Business. Um, but that's not why we're here. Our guest this evening, Joe Garner, was born in Hertfordshire, the son of a de Havilland aeronautics engineer. He went to King's College School and Magdalen Col College, Cambridge, and he now lives in London with his wife and son. Joe's earlier career was in consumer products with Procter & Gamble and electronics with D Dixon's Carphone. Joining HSBC in 2004, he became a group general manager and head of their UK retail and commercial businesses until 2012. In 2014, he became CEO at OpenReach, the UK's digital infrastructure provider, still part of BT Group, though technically a separate company now. Interestingly, uh, I'm in the telecoms industry. I'm a consultant in telecoms. So it's, it's good to see that Joe has touched on my own field in the past. Nationwide, the world's largest business uh, building society with a principle of mutuality and a service ethos which, in, which inspired Joe to join as CEO in April 2016. Consumer-focused organisations have been at the heart of Joe's working life. At Nationwide, Joe's mission has been to inspire colleagues to remain true to its purpose and to improve people's lives. Obviously easily bored, Joe was also a non-executive director of the Financial Ombudsman Service between 2007 and 2010 and chair of the Financial Services Authority Practitioner Panel. All of these things are quite mouthful, as you can appreciate. From 2011 to 2013, rejoining as a panel member in 2016. At Cambridge, Joe was a keen rowing cox and captain of the Magdalen College Boat Club. He's still keen on sport and fitness, and last year he competed in the Great Britain Age Group Squad at the European Multisport Championships. He's the chairman of the British Triathlon Trust, the official charity of British Triathlon bringing free fun events to over 100,000 children of all abilities. Joe is a champion of organisational culture and values and created na Nationwide's Leading for Mutual Good programme for aspiring talent across business, the public sector and charitable organisations. The, pr the purpose of the programme 
is to instill values of mutuality and trust into financial services and society at a time when the world is becoming more polarised than ever before. So I'm delighted to introduce Joe Garner to speak about this project, Leading for Mutual Good. Joe. Just being, just being switched on. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you very much for that kind invitation and introduction and kind invitation to come here this evening. And thank you for all of you on particularly such a glorious um, February summer's day <laughs> of choosing to come and, and uh, uh, listen to and hopefully have a little discussion about some of the things we're going to talk about. Um, my name's Joe Garner, uh, although actually technically it's not. My real name is Johnson Garner and I used to abbreviate it to J-O. Um, but as you heard, I, I was most interested in sport rather than, than studying. And at university, I added an E on the end of my name because the end of my first year report said, it's hard to assess Joe's work because she has not attended many lectures. <laughs> in fact, thinking about it, I've just about doubled the number of lectures that I've been involved in by standing here this evening. <laughs> So, um, however, I think this is, uh, what I'd like to do this evening is try and talk a bit about um, where I see things today. I mean, I, I've been really fortunate in that I've worked across a number of different industries and actually a number of different countries. I spent most of the 1990s in, in Eastern Europe living in Bucharest, Romania. Uh, and, but what drew me to Nationwide is that principle of mutuality. Nationwide is not a bank, it is not a company, it is not a corporation, it is a society a society founded in 1884 by eight members of the Cooperative Association in what was post Dickensian London, contemplating what they could do to help improve living conditions for people they termed the industrious classes. You roll forward to today, and yes, we are now a large business. We have over 15 million members that still own us. We have a balance sheet of close to a quarter of a trillion pounds. We're the second largest provider of savings and mortgage loans in the country but we do our very best to stay true to that social purpose around which we are founded. Yes, we have to make a profit, but we have to make sufficient profit, not the maximum amount of profit that we can. And whilst we don't get everything right and we make our mistakes like any large organisation, we do try very hard to stay true to that purpose. But what I'd like to talk about tonight is in a world where I don't think we're going through cyclical change. I think we're going through discontinuity. Uh, I would like to outline some of the most fundamental things that I think are changing around us all that are going to shape the next generation. And then why I believe that actually leadership has never been more important <coughs> in the environment that we are all living in today. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the thinking that we've been developing within Nationwide around how we think about leadership, our definition of leadership, which in some ways may be familiar, may be different, but how we're trying to play our part in shaping the leadership of the future. Does that sound all right? Yeah. No? Okay, we're going to go. So first, things going on in the world today. First of all, China or the swing back to the east, the rise of emerging markets. With the population of China somewhere around 1.5 billion and rising with India, I think it's a good bet that within 10 years of now, China and India will control the largest segment of world trade and GDP. And interestingly, that is a swing not to the east, but a swing back to the east, as China and India did control the largest segment of world trade from most of the last 2,000 years. But this is a profound pivot towards emerging markets. Secondly, technology and the impact of technology that we are still, I believe, in the foothills of experiencing. The student in Starbucks today holds in their hand, in their iPhone, many times the computing power that existed on Earth just a few decades ago. And I truly believe that in time, the search engine will be far more revolutionary than the steam engine. And whether you are working in travel, in telecoms, in media, in banking, as a building society, the level of disruption that is sweeping through our industries is deeply profound. And that poses questions for all businesses and organizations. Like how do you create a culture 
where innovation can thrive, particularly for large incumbent organizations, particularly in heavily regulated industries, where the innovating freedom fighter can so easily be labeled a terrorist, and where compliance with the rules is so important, and yet we need to create the space for innovation to thrive. And on a day like today, we don't need reminding that there are fundamental shifts happening in our climate, and whether we label it resource depletion, climate change, global warming, we are going to start to see the very human and very economic impact of the trends that we know are accelerating in this area. And all of that is being layered into a world of quite unprecedented complexity of interplay. And the pressures, again, on all businesses to become more efficient are uncompromising. And searching for that holy grail of what's lowest cost to the business, but also most convenient for your customers or members, and easiest for your colleagues to deliver. And if that wasn't enough, there's an incredible pressure for change. There's a media and social media that will amplify a feeling of unrest, and where a single action ricochets around the world at lightning speed, at lightning speed. And then, of course, we have this, <laughs> which is something of a headache, not least for her, <laughs> and not to mention him. Because sitting behind Brexit, we have some deep issues in the Eurozone countries and some, what I heard someone describe as man-made issues around global trade between US and China. And all of that stokes an anxiety, a sense of fear, and sometimes anger towards those who are seen as having benefited from decades of liberal global capitalism. And I think it's important that we take the time to stop and think. I think Einstein said that the world is the product of our thinking. If we want to change the world, we must first change our thinking. But how do we make sense of this complexity, of these conflicting external pressures? What does it mean? Well, I think that one of the big fault lines through the world today <clears throat> is not along geographic, nationalistic, race, religion, or other lines, but rather attitudinal. And in an environment where anxieties are lifted, the risk that a world that has more or less for the last 70 years been on a pathway towards greater cooperation and collaboration seems to be hesitating and wondering if actually competition might be a better path. Stefan Shakespeare, the pollster, said, we are all either drawbridge up or drawbridge down. And by that he meant we all have an attitudinal divide. When we see a stranger, what's our attitude? Do we see a potential friend? Do we see a potential business opportunity? Do we see someone that we could help and work with? Or do we see a threat? And do we want to lift our drawbridge and bar our windows? As a mutual organization, we were founded on the principle of cooperation, the belief that we can achieve more together than we can individually. And operating in a world today, when I listen to many leaders, and I wonder if I'm listening to a leader or sometimes a bully, I believe that there's a role for business to play in setting the right tonality or setting a tonality around leadership that talks to the needs of the wider society. <coughs> On joining Nationwide in 2016, I also was very interested to ask the question, what kind of leadership do we need as an organization facing into those external challenges in the next chapter? And ironically, all those pressures, particularly around technology, mean that we have to create, I believe, an organization that is agile enough to compete, agile enough to move fast. And that means creating what the military call agility in the moment. The ability for people to make decisions rapidly without having to work through layers of governance and hierarchy which slow things down and yet to remain safe at the same time. And Nationwide, which is a tremendously successful organization, and I would say it has a very healthy culture overall, 
One of my observations in 2016 is that it was a curious mixture of democracy, but also hierarchy. And I felt it was time to refresh our definition of what leadership is. And that's what I'd like to take you through now, our definition of how we think about leadership at Nationwide. We have three E's because you do need a, an abbreviation for uh, people to remember. But I think some E's you might expect and some might be slightly different. But the first E is envisioning. Envisioning. Everything is created twice. Once in someone's mind and then in reality. I have a nine-year-old son and I think I've spent a lot of the last nine years sitting on the floor building Lego. <laughs> and nothing is a more powerful illustration of how everything is created twice. You don't just sit there and just start building. You have to have an idea. You have to have a sense at least of what it is you're going to build. And then my experience is actually things were created a lot more than twice in, the, in that example. But um, it starts with a dream, an ability to look out above the clouds, to see through the ups and downs of what's transient to what's really important, and create a picture of the possible world, the world that your organization, our organization, is seeking to create. I love the expression, a leader is a dealer in hope, because hope is the moral virtue or value that underpins vision, the ability to look forward to a future world and what it might be like. And where does that happen? Does it happen you know, in the middle of a meeting? Does it happen when you're doing emails on your iPhone? Or does it happen in those quiet moments, those so rare quiet moments, when you're away from the heat of the immediate, when you actually have time to reflect? T. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, said, and forgive the male bias in his turn of phrase, but perhaps the content of it. All men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they may act on their dreams with open eyes to make them possible. We have to dream. We have to first create the world that we want to be, and then set to making it happen. And how difficult is that when with every free moment, what's our inclination to do? <coughs> Catch up on our latest message. And not only that, I think there's been a shift, particularly in the last couple of decades, of the importance in inspiration as opposed to direction. When I started my career at Procter & Gamble, you know, the, the, the boss fellow would sit in the corner office working diligently on a one-page memo, and it was one page, in 12-point Helvetica or Times Roman. <laughs> and they were the rules. It's a fabulous discipline, by the way. Um, and you'd get the memo, and it would be a brilliant worker strategy, and off you'd go and do your level best to make that happen. And I don't know whether it's because of social media or reality TV or Simon Cowell or what it is, but today, I get the sense that before anyone's going to follow anyone, they want to know what you're like. They want to know, can they trust you? Maybe a result of so many high-profile scandals and failures, both in corporate life and beyond. But actually, it's not enough to provide direction. I think a leader today has to also create inspiration. On Joining Nationwide, we obviously also took the opportunity to think about our strategy. But rather than just bring in some people and, and, and do a private exercise, we, we did something called the Big Conversation. We went out and we asked all 18,000 of our people what they thought we did well, what they thought we could do better. And over a period of five weeks, we actually gathered 22,000 pieces of individual feedback from our people on what they thought they liked, what they wanted to change, what we could do better. And then we ingested that as part of forming our strategy built around the core purpose of building society nationwide and our five cornerstones. But then we thought, well, how are we going to then communicate the output of that? Well, the same principle. We thought, well, we don't want to communicate it. We want to make it a shared experience. So we invited all 18,000 of our people to an event, which we imaginatively called the big event. <laughs> and 
through a day, we had about 12, 13,000 of our people come and spend a day experiencing our strategy being brought to life. A key part of envisioning as well, I believe, is storytelling. I think we are hard-coded to learn through stories. And today, um, I think it's as important or more important than ever to be able to tell the stories that bring to life not just the purpose, but the myths and legends that form part of that interesting soup that is culture that actually guide behavior day to day. One of the things I do put a lot of time into is my blog. Um, I, I write a, what is effectively a thousand word piece every two to three weeks and you'd think who's got time or energy to read a thousand words in, in today's um, environment, but actually people do. And typically between a quarter and a third of our organization do engage uh, with my blog depending on the subject. But what it is is storytelling. It's storytelling. It's bringing to life the, the, the thoughts and insights that are important to help people move towards our vision of the world that we're trying to contribute to. So if it starts with a dream, with a vision, with, a, with an idea, the next E is about <coughs> empowering, empowering our people to be able to move towards that vision. When I joined Nationwide, I went to a, an, an event very early on, and it was a fabulous event. It was well run. It was great. And they had those big sort of stand, you know, the big banners that you have at events that say, here's the name of the event, and there's the logo at the bottom. And then there was this little image. Well, it wasn't that little because it was a big floor stand thing. But this image on the thing. And I thought it was really interesting because it was a little sign of the sense, one aspect of the culture. You got, you know, a big blob at the top, three different colored blobs in the middle, and some arrows pointing down. And we're not unique in this. All large organizations typically have had aspects of hierarchy and rules and process by which they operate. Uh, there's a wonderful quote by um, E.O. Wilson, which is, we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And I often reflect on that, that we are fundamentally the same as we were a couple of million years ago. We have these large institutions that we have grown to, and re but still, and now, the most incredible capabilities in technology. And don't get me wrong, there's a very important role for rules and policies in organizations, yeah? particularly in financial services. You can't do it approximately. You can't say, oh, there's your statement. You know, it's about right. <laughs> if there's a problem, we'll fix it next month. You know, things have got to be really accurate and at scale. So there is a role for rules, and rules are a great shorthand. You know, this, this says drive safely, not just obey the speed limit. But rules and an over-reliance on rules is potentially very limiting and dangerous. Limiting because, as Alan Greenspan said, they are in the context of Sarbanes-Oxley, which was, of course, a set of rules designed in the wake of a large corporate failure, in that case on Enron, to prevent a recurrence but a nightmare because of the complexity that can be created. But there is a darker side of a reliance as a leader on rule compliance and hierarchy as your modus operandi. And that, I think, was so powerfully illustrated by Stanley Milgram in 1963 when he did an experiment, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it, where he, um, he took people off, off the street and said, we're doing a, just a, a, a sort of experiment thing, and then got them to administer electric shocks to people in the next room. The people in the next room were actors, and it was not real electricity. But what he proved is that two out of three people will administer what they know to be a lethal dose of electricity when told to do so by a figure of authority. And uh, you can see it's quite harrowing. You can st see it all on YouTube if you like. That, that experiment has been replicated or was replicated. I don't think anyone would do such a thing today uh, even to test it. But what it shows is that if you create an environment where people have higher than a healthy level of fear, then they may suspend their human judgment and do what they're told. In today's fast-moving environment, 
we'd like to create an environment where everybody can use their whole human capability, not limited by fear of sanction. And ironically, Sir Derek Hicks, who did one of the first reviews, late Sir Derek Hicks, on, on corporate governance, said, no matter how wonderful your corporate governance processes, if you cannot trust your people, then you are at risk. Now, I'm not saying that rules aren't important or processes aren't important. They are. What I'm saying is that rules alone are not enough. And the challenge of an organization is how to have the rules that work as a life jacket, not a straight jacket. How do you have rules that people will stand in front of, not hide behind? This is probably one of the most central challenges on how we are trying to move our organization in cultural terms. And we talk about creating an environment of accountable freedom. And these two words have probably been two of the most discussed and controversial words that have introduced into the language of Nationwide. Um, but I love that. I love the dialogue because actually it's the richness in the dialogue that drives progress. It's teams talking about what does it really mean, accountable freedom? I'll say what I think it means. Well, everybody in our organization is accountable for the outcome. And it's incumbent on us as leaders to help ensure that everyone has that clear vision of the outcome that we are seeking. They are then free to use their whole human capability consistent with our values and aligned with our strategy. And that's what it means for me. What it does not mean is... I've got a sort of get out of jail. Well, I didn't like the process, so I used my accountable freedom. You know? and, and the analogy I use, and, and, and I borrow from a wonderful conductor called Itai Talgam, who, who, who again, if you, if you would like to see a fabulous TED talk, um, his, I think, is, is wonderful. And he draws the analogy with conducting. And as a musician in an orchestra, I would imagine that you are free to contribute with your whole human capability. In fact, that's what you are probably there to do. But what you wouldn't do is change the notes. You wouldn't change the process. You wouldn't say, I don't like that note. I think this is a better note. Because yeah? even if it is a better note, the collective outcome is compromised. So a clarity of outcome, of strategy, and an alignment of values can create the accountable freedom for people to contribute at their best. And as uh, I think the late Norman Schwarzkopf said, leadership is a potent combination of strategy and character. But if you must be without one, be without the strategy. <laughs> I think it's better to have both, but I thought he said that very well. So the second E is about empowering people to be able to contribute at their best. How much of a difference does it make if just one person puts their whole heart into what they're doing? The discretionary effort that actually holds together and powers the very core of most of what we do in our lives. When it comes to the third E, I think this is possibly where we maybe diverge slightly more strongly from some conventional approaches in this area. In guessing a third E, I imagine many of you would have gone to execution or edge and those things are important. Without execution, without things happening, and happening at scale in a quality way, everything is just theory. I think Churchill said, however wonderful, however beautiful your strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. <laughs> but actually, and so those things are important, and edge is important. And just because we're a mutual doesn't mean we don't have to make tough decisions and sometimes make decisions that people won't like or might not be happy about. We have to do that too. But the third E is pointed at what I think is a much more emerging challenge, which is the challenge of human sustainability in this constant 24-7 environment. You know, there used to be a boundary around work that's kind of stopped when you left and came back when you went back in again. But now, post-Blackberry into today's era, the boundary between work and life has become immensely porous. And actually, I think the idea of work-life balance, when someone asks about work-life balance, I sort of go, if we're starting with work-life balance, it's not going to balance because you're saying there's this kind of great thing called life and this bad thing called work, and I'm trying to balance them, and it's just not going to work. I think we need to think about work-life integration. 
And how do we make that porous barrier porous in both directions? I vigorously resisted calling this third thing resilience, partly because it doesn't start with E, <laughs> but mostly because resilience, again, sort of says, oh, gosh, you're going to have all this bad stuff happening all the time, and you've just got to learn how to be resilient enough to put up with it, which, again, I think is kind of the wrong start point and doomed to failure, because if you're fighting it the whole time, sooner or later you're going to lose. So we talk about energy and trying to create energy. And I'm very public about this in an attempt to um, give permission to the organization to do the same. My own experience of it was probably most acute when I was working at OpenReach. Uh, this is a real photo. You can tell by the cleansiness of my jacket relative to the others. <laughs> yeah? Should do some Photoshop sort of dirt on there for a thing, yeah? Um, so it's a every time it rains, Every time it rains, my first thought goes to the 23,000 OpenReach engineers who will be out there trying as hard as they can to fix someone's broadband who will probably be screaming at them at that very, very moment. Um, it was a very, very 24-7 environment at the time because when it comes to connectivity, it is 24-7. <laughs> Um, and this was a time when I got very interested in the subject of personal energy and well-being. And the start point that it is not selfish to look after yourself as a leader. It is not selfish to look after yourself as a leader. The um, most powerful uh, way I think that this comes to life is when you're having that safety briefing on an aeroplane. And what do they say to you? Passengers with children, first put the oxygen mask on yourself and then on your child. If you do not look after yourself, then how can you look after anybody else? And actually, there is a central importance in positions of leadership to thinking about what kind of energy am I bringing into the room? Because the most contagious aspect, I think, of human nature is the emotion. Emotions are hugely contagious. I have a good prediction that despite my best efforts, in a few months' time, you won't remember very much of what I've said here this evening, but you might have a sense of what you sort of felt or what you felt I was feeling. And that, again, I think is a deeply human characteristic that is as relevant today as it's ever been. But what happens as a leader as you get more senior in your position? Well, one of the things, of the things that happens is uh, you have more people, typically, in your part of the organization, and larger part of the organization. And what happens when something goes wrong in your part of the world? What's the first thing you do, or the second thing you do? Probably tell your line manager. And one of the things that happens, in my experience, as you take on positions of leadership of greater influence or responsibility, is you get more bad news. <laughs> it just sort of comes with the territory, yeah? Because that's the way bad news flows. And actually, and here's the subtlety on it, as you take on positions of greater responsibility, it's vitally important that you do get more bad news. Because if you're not, it means people aren't telling you. And if they're not telling you, your ability to do something about it is greatly diminished. But when you get more and more bad news, it's quite easy to let it knock you out of balance. And progressively then, you become a leader that people maybe don't want to talk to or approach or share their thoughts openly with. And that's where things start to go wrong. So a concept that I talk about a bit is about becoming self-leveling. How do you, in a day when you're going to have lots of stuff go wrong, you're going to have people send you problems, you're going to have all sorts of difficulties, how do you develop the ability, not to brush them off, because I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about absorb it and yet stay in a level stage, not to fly off on one. Because if you do that as a leader, if you get angry and, and shout at someone or something in a position of leadership that will leave an indelible mark on how other people feel about you in that role. So 
a few thoughts on things that work for me and I advocate to try and give air cover and permission to the organization to do the same. The first is sleep. Yeah. I, I, I feel hugely passionate about the importance of sleep. Um, let's do a quick survey. Who's, who gets more than eight hours sleep a night? Okay, more than seven? Six? Five? Okay. Uh, right, so I'm going to draw very heavily on, I, I don't read many books, I read on average about one a year, which means I choose really, really carefully which book I read, and this is the book that I read, um, and uh, I strongly commend it to you. Start point for this discussion. If you need an alarm clock to wake you up in the morning, you're not getting enough sleep. If you need an alarm clock to wake you up in the morning, you're not getting enough sleep. Our bodies work that we go to sleep at night, we wake up in the morning. Yeah, we've not evolved to need alarm clocks to wake us up in the morning. It has become very fashionable over the last 40, 50 years to be sleep deprived and busy. Busyness has almost become a currency of importance. When I meet people and they go, oh, I'm CEO. Oh, you must be really busy. <laughs> As though somehow, you know, there's a correlation between importance and busyness. And now I've said that, watch for it when you talk with people about how busy are you, you know, oh, I'm terrible, yeah? Actually, and I, I, I try and think about how I answer the question, because I, I wouldn't like to be any more or less busy than anyone in the organization. Everyone has got more demands on their time than they could possibly fill a working day with. I once worked for a wonderful leader, at, at, uh, actually, when I was at HSBC, and it was a late night. It was about 8.30. I was in the office. I was working away, and he was walking out with his briefcase, and he said, you're working late tonight? And I said, yeah. And he said, 35 years, and I've never finished a day. 35 years and I've never finished a day. And it really stayed with me because there'll always be more to do than you can do. But it's become fashionable to say, oh, I only need six hours sleep a night. I've worked for a number of people who only need six hours sleep a night and they may have thought that they were superheroes, but what I experienced was a strung out, unpredictable, moody boss. <laughs> Matthew Walker in this book quotes... Uh, saying that, yes, it is true, there is a small proportion of people who genetically just happen to be able to function adequately on less than seven hours sleep a night. But that proportion of people, rounded to the nearest whole percentage, is zero. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and lovely, this is also referenced in the book, I sort of have um, snatched this off Google Images. Um, other things we do that we all do, I've, coffee, the impact of coffee. Uh, does coffee keep you awake? What does it do, etc.? cetera? Uh, there's a great section on it, but look at this. This is an experiment that NASA did, and only NASA could do this, right? So they gave different drugs to spiders. <laughs> let them sp spin webs. Now, I don't know how you do that, uh, but NASA do. And that's a normal spider's web. Call hydrate, I think, is a sort of sedative. Marijuana, you can see. Ecstasy, LSD is interesting. <laughs> but only on caffeine did spiders completely lose the ability <laughs> to spin anything that looks like a web. Now, I'm not arguing against coffee. I love coffee, etc. But the half-life of coffee is a lot longer than we might think it is. And, and actually, the impact is so easy to get caught in that spiral. I haven't got enough time to sleep, so I'll have coffee. Then I don't sleep well, etc. The other thing that I'm a huge advocate of, and my wife got me into this, is Headspace. Um, headspace, uh, any Headspaces here? Or, or medita meditation? Okay, great. Um, what is it? Meditation without the incense is how I would, I would describe it. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, this is one of many apps that do it. I love it, and I have a simple view, which is if you wanted to perform better in, in physical sense, you would train your body. If you want to you know, be able to, your mind to perform better, you would train your mind. And that, for me, is what meditation is. It's just helping you, you know, be in the moment, freer from the ghosts of the past and the anxieties of the future and more in the moment. And um, I still, even on, on days when I'm a bit compressed for sleep time, I would, this is the only thing I would trade 20 minutes of sleep for, uh, is to do that. And it's quite good because you pay a small monthly subscription and it starts very guided and then ends up sort of mostly silence. And I always think, what a brilliant business model. <laughs> so, uh, 20 minutes of um, paying for silence. Maybe that's a reflection on the world today. We will pay for silence. 
But it is so important because operating in positions of leadership today, as, as Sherry Barr said, you know, expecting life to be fair because you think you're a good person is like expecting a bull not to charge you because you're a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. Stuff is going to happen, and when it does, your reaction in those moments of adversity as a leader are defining. One more thought on self-leveling, which um, has been a popular theme within Nationwide, is have a thing that keeps you sane. Have a thing that's not work, that's not family, that's not illegal, that, <laughs> that keeps you sane. And it doesn't matter if it's sumo wrestling, basket weaving, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But have a thing that you draw energy from, a thing that gives you energy. It can be within the workplace or, or outside of it, in fact, but a thing that you draw energy from. And there's always a reason not to, and there's always a way that you can. There's always an urgent phone call. There's always a more important meeting. There's always someone who wants you, but there's always a way you can make it happen as well. A couple of examples from my own uh, experience. I love cycling. This is a picture I took on top of Box Hill uh, a little while ago now. If I want to be on my own, I go cycling. If I want to be with people, I go cycling. And I did for a period of time, um, I did for a period of time do running and swimming, and therefore I had this ambition in about 2003 to uh, see if I could qualify in the age group for triathlon. And then um, this happened. Now, uh, this is my spine. Those people who made a noise will be people that know that this is, in this case, S5, uh, sorry, L5S1, so the lower bit of the spine. And that bulging bit there is what a slipped or prolapsed disc is, and it's just the disc pushes out and it sits on, on the nerves. And anyone who's had back trouble, when there will be many people in, in, in the room who have, will know just how debilitating uh, it is. And I had two of those injections in the, in the back, and I went to see the, the, the surgeon who's doing it, and I said, you know, when can I run again? And he said, oh, this afternoon. And I'm like, really? He said, yeah, yeah, you can run this. And I said, well, what, is, it, does it, is it better? Is it? He said, no, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. Yeah. So I can't tell you if you can run another five kilometers or another 5,000 kilometers, but if you keep running, you, know, you will be back here and it will be, will be surgery. So ask yourself, do you really need to run? And I thought of it like that and thought I'd rather be playing tennis with my son in 10 years' time than running today. So I gave it up and it was harder. I still, for a long time, I had dreams where I'd be running in, 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 a, in a dream. Um, but I kept cycling and swimming and, and playing tennis and doing some other things. And then last year, they instigated a European Championships for something called Aquabike. That's not, as my son thinks, cycling underwater. <laughs> it's, it is a triathlon without the run. It's swimming and then cycling. And because it was the first year, it wasn't too competitive. And it was in Ibiza, which was the main um, <laughs> sort of thing. So last, last year, um, I actually managed to uh, qualify in, in my age group and competed in, in Ibiza. And the point about that is, uh, to the organization is a sign that if I can find the time and to prioritize those sorts of things, then it's OK for someone to be in late one morning because they're collecting kids from school or taking kids to school or, or whatever they're doing. It's OK to create that because I'm demonstrating as well. Because... <coughs> There's always a reason not to, and there's always a way that you can. But if you don't create that space, where are you going to have that breakthrough idea, craft that vision of the future? When I go out on my bike on a Sunday morning, that's when I'm writing my blog. Yeah. I'm not actually, someone asked me, you really? <laughs> do that? I'm not actually writing, but that's when I'm forming the, the thoughts and, and the thought line and reflecting. And, and how much has been driven out of our lives by our constant access to technology. But those are possibly the most important moments. And therefore, as a leader, I think it's tremendously important that we signal those. And also, don't we have a human responsibility to create an environment where people can enjoy the moment that they have? Because at the end of the day, that's the only moment we do have. And as leaders, we have a responsibility, I think, to the people that we lead. We have now at Nationwide embedded the three E's as our leadership framework. 
most of our most influential 1,000 leaders now get one-up feedback from their teams on the degree to which they envision, empower, and energize them. In a way, what we're trying to do is reverse the polarity of those arrows so that leadership is something that is judged in the eyes of those who are part of the team rather than something judged looking down. And we've put in place leadership development, again, for our thousand, but also for our most influential 200, which is not our most senior 200, our most influential 200. Some of those are hierarchical positions, some of those are large people leadership positions, and some of those are people who have been voted into the leadership 200. We run a program called Leading for Mutual Good, where we immerse ourselves for the best part of a week in these concepts. And from day one, we've opened it up beyond our boundaries for the reasons that I started with to try and create or help amplify an alternative narrative to the narrative of conflict and competition, but rather one of collaboration and cooperation. And I'm pleased to say that we've now had attendees on the program from organizations as diverse as John Lewis, City of London Corporation, Shelter, Macmillan, uh, the Metropolitan Police, and coming up we have representatives from uh, the co-op and from the Air Force and from the Army. And I hope that in time it also builds networks and different ways of thinking for a different world. And the most difficult part of it all, that I think the most difficult thing for a leader today is to let go. It's actually to create that space and resist the temptation to manage down and control in a world where agility in the moment has become the all-defining thing. But we have a wonderful opportunity in the moment that we have, the opportunity to work together, the opportunity to set a leadership tone that genuinely embraces the principles of working together and creates space for the fabulous next gener generation of leaders that are coming through. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, it's time for some questions and discussion. Uh, if anyone is tweeting today, then the hashtag for this event is hashtag Bristol Lectures. Uh, if you'd like to put your hand up, if you've got a question, and wait for a roving mic to come to you. So we've got a gentleman over there um, in the about the fifth row up. Um, and uh, if you could say your name and where you're from first, that would be wonderful. Sorry, place, is that on? Joe, thank you so much. What an interesting uh, talk, I really appreciate it. My name's uh, Charles Shammy, I'm a financial advisor and a mortgage broker as well. Um, re I'm 36 years old. Something me and my friends have talked about a lot is that as we all progress in our careers, we're noticing things get more competitive. Meetings that we're in uh, involve more posturing. Um, there's more dynamics at play. Uh, people at our level a lot more than they than they are at junior levels in our career, and and, and we've observed that you know people that progress and do as well as you have uh, must be extremely capable of navigating that scenario. Um, I really like and agree everything you were talking about with the softer side of you know how to sort of balance your life and all the rest of it. But getting to where you've got, how do you reconcile the competition element to be ambitious and progress? with the stuff you talked about today? Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting question. Um, and, uh, so for, so, and I recognize it. Yeah. And I actually think, I've heard it argued that actually it's more competitive, sort of somewhere in the middle, than it is at either the top or the bottom. Because at the bottom, you've got lots more positions. And, and at the top, you've got fewer candidates. Uh, but actually, in the middle, it's a really competitive space to be. It's certainly, I think, in many ways, the most difficult space to be because in a large organization, you're getting all this sort of direction from above and you're getting all the issues from below. And in a way, you're buffering change. And actually, I think it's one of the toughest spots to be in. Um, don't get me wrong. I spent uh, you know, a lot of my career, my early career, 
working very long hours. I got very ill twice. Um, and, uh, I, you know, very ill twice. It's part of why I feel so strongly about exercise. Um, and I left my job at HSBC because I didn't want to move to Hong Kong for family reasons. So there have been a few, you know, moments in my career where, which I guess have led me to the conclusion that actually, you know, it, however competitive it is, if you stand by your values, you know, it can still work out. I think the other big factor uh, is luck, which is a massively underplayed factor in things. Um, and, but I've had a, a good share of downs as well as, as ups in there as well. And I think we will all get um, rejected from jobs that we want to make, get to and have things go wrong. And I think that's not unusual. I do think what is most defining is how we react to those setbacks. Um, I started a business that went out of business. Um, I have gone for jobs that I've not got. Um, I have had moments when I felt like I'm not going to get to do what I want to do. Um, I have been lucky, um, but I don't feel that I've had to compromise, however competitive it's been, I don't feel that I've had to compromise my most deeply held values <coughs> in order to get on. So I would, you know, I guess what I'm saying is not to be disheartened if, if you know, it feels like it's a competitive world out there, um, a bit like a talking to stay really true to what's the long term, what's the long term vision and keep your faith. So lady here. Okay. Joe, that was super inspiring. And just listening to you talking about, um, about sleep and talking about headspace was fantastic because it's absolutely my language. My name's Lauren Sharon and I run a business called Women of a Certain Stage. I actually left Nationwide about four years ago, ah. so before your time. Um, okay. And I left thinking I had early onset dementia. And it turned out that I had just been through menopause. And I'm finding now that I'm going back out to organisations and educating them on how to recognise and manage those symptoms. It comes back to all those good things. It's about hydration, it's about sleep, it's about exercise, it's about having that downtime. And I'm just curious to ask you what, if anything, is Nationwide doing right now um, to support women coming up to their 40s and 50s? So, um, again, it's, it's an excellent point and highly topical. Um, in fact, uh, tomorrow I'm with our Leadership 200, and this is one of the central themes, because um, there are a couple of things within there. So, yes, you can see we're doing things generally around well-being, but we've also got a lot to do in terms of the diversity agenda. Um, we are uh, actually, in terms of gender diversity at the senior levels, we are, you know, sort of 34%, so we're above the Women in Finance Charter, but that is about the highlight. We've got a lot more work to do in the organisation. And it's not the, and this is what I feel so strongly about. It's not about the tick box diversity of the ratios and the numbers. It's about the inclusivity of a culture that recognises that, you know, this is something that needs dealing with and, and talking about. Um, so I think what we have got, we've got a wonderful um, uh, networks that we have recently really reinvigorated and in particularly some new networks around carers as well that, that are sort of working through the organization in very different ways. We are refreshing our ambitions in this area because speaking candidly, it's not an area where I think we are leading by example as strongly as we should be and we can't be building society nationwide if we're not also representative and understanding of the society that we serve. So actually I think, you know, we, we are not the example that we are striving to be. The gentleman in the check shirt uh, on the fourth row in the middle, <coughs> middle section. <coughs> Hi, Joe. Um, thank you very much. Hello. Yes. Hello. My name's Frank. Um, I'm a retired brigadier, um, 30 years in the army. Um, thank you very much for that. It's fascinating. And, and, and actually, it sounded very familiar. Um, the army went through the same process of the boss being the one that told you what to do. Um, we had some disasters along the way, um, some public, some not. And we got to a place where actually we, we, we created frameworks for people to be empowered. Um, but the reality was there are always positive energy folk and there are always less positive energy folk and in the military battles are lost when the guys with the positive energy the guys and girls 
are themselves lost and then the others take over and everyone um, retreats. That's a little simplistic, but that's roughly it. How in your organization do you make sure that the positive energy folks stay on top? Yeah, um, so from where, so it is important that alongside this there is also a rigorous you know, assessment of leadership, capability and talent. And, and actually that has to go alongside it. What I'm not talking about is the sort of performance ratings and exiting the bottom X percent, etc. cetera. Um, or I'm not, I'm not talking about is personal incentivization because I, I really believe strongly against that. And we've, we have changed a lot of things at Nationwide in that direction. But there does need to also be the honest conversations. And, and that has to be a feature of the healthy culture as well. And I think, again, that's an area where, you know, I think speaking honestly, we can do more as well. Um, but I think so you know over the over the last three years i think we've moved a long way in this direction we have actually reduced our hierarchical senior leadership by quite a significant proportion so it does that but but that needs to be an ongoing discussion with people who it may be it may be negativity it may be that career ambitions are different it may be that it's just not right etc but that honest honesty about personal contribution needs to be a part of this of any healthy culture the gentleman in the blue jumper just a roll below. Sebastian Crawshaw, I sold the business in Swindon to a PLC a few years ago, and I'm visiting professor here. Um, love the conversation about um, uh, headspace and thinking, but actually I had a much more Swindon-based question, right. which was, um, in view of the size of nationwide yes. um, relative to the employment base, how, is there a plan or are you working on a plan by which uh, you might assist some of the people who are going to lose their jobs at Honda? Yeah, so yes, I mean, it's, it's very sad news regarding Honda in, in Swindon. Um, we are doing a number of things directly and indirectly. Of course, we have both, um, we have employees whose partners friends, relations, etc., will be working at Honda today. Um, we are very live and active in terms of managing direct relationships that we've got. We've also got a number of indirect things that we're doing. So I was, um, I was actually, uh, I saw Greg Clark on, on Monday um, and I was r reminding him that Swindon has an application in to create a technical uh, institute that is one of the things that I think Swindon has really lacked has been. You know, it doesn't have a university, it doesn't have a feeder for the future, it's, it's a key part of it. Also, there's an application in for the future of the high streets fund that's available for Swindon as well. So we're trying to directly help those affected where we can, indirectly influence the policy agenda. And we're also doing a couple of other things that are um, which we were doing anyway. Um, look, we're a building society. There's a national shortage of housing. We're the largest employer in Swindon. So we've made the decision to finance the uh, generation of a community housing project in Swindon. That's not all affordable housing. It's intergenerational. It's really to say, let's take this bit of you know, scrubland and create a sustainable intergenerational community here. And we're financing that. We're working with a, with a, a partner who's got track record in this space. We're not, you know, we'll... It's 40, 50 million um, in investment. We're not looking to make money on it. We're hoping not to lose money on it. We're hoping to make a direct contribution to Swindon and maybe also pioneer um, a, a way that large organisations can make a direct contribution in, in areas where they're a large employer. I think we've got only time for one more question to so the gentleman there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and perhaps a fitting question to uh, end with then, hopefully. Um, I found your talk and you, uh, as you came through that talk, truly inspiring um, uh, as, a, as a leader. And that's moved me to ask you uh, what might be a bigger question. Um, I don't know if you'd agree with me that uh, what leaders in commerce can do uh, is somewhat limited by what leaders in society do and how they act. And whether you'd agree with me um, with the feeling that uh, our leaders in society, both uh, nationally and in other places internationally, um, are not exactly living up to the sorts of ideals that you're professing. And I wonder if you've got any thoughts on how, as a nation, or even as a world, for that matter, um, we, we, we develop a culture whereby our, our societal leaders um, are, are the sort of leaders that they should be and perhaps not the sort of leaders they are today. Well, that is indeed a big question. 
Um, look, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't profess to know the, the answer to it. I, th I, I do think that perhaps um, I could describe a vacuum of leadership that uh, there has been, it has become, uh, I think there's become a confusion between understanding sentiment and following it and the difference between that and understanding the right course of action and following it. And it's difficult. I can tell you it's difficult in positions of leadership because, uh, you know, the point of leadership is not being popular. But in a social media era, you, sh you know very quickly what people think about you and what you're doing and so on. So there's a massive pressure on leaders to do popular things, not necessarily right things. And a lot of what's embedded within the, 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 the philosophy that, that I'm talking about is the importance of principles. Sometimes the fair thing might not be a popular thing. The loyal thing might not be a popular thing. The most sustainable thing might not. But we need the courage to stand by those principles on the difficult days when you know, it's, it's hardest to do so. Um, I do think that if I'm right that there's something of a vacuum of leadership in a number of quarters, then actually business leaders have a greater responsibility than they've ever had to set some of that tonality and perhaps provide some alternative narrative where it is missing. And it is incumbent on business leaders as well to bridge the gap that has emerged between what a lot of people and, you know, feel that is that, that, that it's not working for me, you know, and business has a responsibility to bridge that gap and maybe can do something to fill a vacuum of leadership where it has emerged. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you all for um, making it uh, here today on this um, once-in-a-lifetime uh, February summer's day. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and you will agree that uh, the presentation, the speech by Joe was absolutely, I think, uh, to quote the lady there, super inspiring. And you brought to life the three simple words, empower, enable, and energize. So we thank you for it, Joe, and taking the time out to, to come here. Um, Joe will... <laughs> Uh, Joe will be here for uh, a few more minutes, so we've got some refreshments and networking um, up um, where, where, where you were before. Uh, please make the most of it, and please uh, pop by to speak to Joe. I know there were several hands still up, so there's an opportunity to, to have a chat with Joe. Um, and uh, for those who are looking to get a CPD certification, uh, please make sure that uh, you visit the event reception desk. Finally, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Joe. Cheers.